Hey everyone, and thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Justin, and we got a little bit of Leafs news, which is great because it's the middle of the summer and there's just not a whole lot to talk about when it comes to the NHL and the Toronto Maple Leafs. So with a little bit of news that we did get, yeah, I'm going to hop on and talk about it. Uh, really not much. First and foremost, uh, the Leafs did hire a couple assistant coaches to their staff, uh, Van Ryan and Guy Boucher. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about the guys, especially as far as their coaching career goes. Van Ryan, I remember vividly watching him getting body checked through the glass as a Toronto Maple Leaf against the Boston Bruins. That's pretty much all I know about the guy. I, I hear he's a terrific coach. He's had a good track record, but I couldn't speak more to him. Uh, Guy, Guy Boucher is actually a guy that I remember being jealous when he was picked up uh, by the Ottawa Senators. To me, he just comes across as, you know, one of those hard-ass guys that can get the best out of his players and isn't going to take any shit from them, which I think is going to fit really, really well when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs bench. And any assistant that can help Sheldon Keefe kind of send that message across, I think is only a good thing. Uh, not to mention the fact that he has experience being a head coach in the NHL, which again, is only an asset for the Leafs. So not much to say about it, but good acquisitions if you were to ask me. The second thing, the biggest thing that we heard this week was the news of Ilya Samsonov, who has come to an agreement or a settlement with his arbitration case. Yes, we heard a couple weeks ago or last week the high and low numbers. We heard the Toronto Maple Leafs lowballing at about 2.4 million. We heard Ilya Samsonov asking for 4.9. Uh, if you were to ask me which of the two numbers was probably a better representation of what Samsonov deserves, I would say he's actually closer to the $4.9 million mark just because goalies tend to get around that 4 to $5 million when they're a starting goalie in the NHL, which Ilya Samsonov, to me, has proven that that is the case. So when it came in at $3.55 million, I was very happy. I think that's very accurate to what I think Samsonov is worth on the open market. I think it works well for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I think if we're moving forward with Samsonov and Wool, having them at cost control is a very good thing. The one thing that stands out about this deal is that it's a one-year contract. Now, that's not a bad thing, uh, especially given the situation that the Toronto Maple Leafs are in. Now, if the Toronto Maple Leafs were looking for a starting goaltender for the foreseeable future, I would feel very uncomfortable with a one-year deal for Ilya Samsonov, where he's then walking into unrestricted free agency and likely leaving the team, unless you're prepared to give him another offer. But you already went through probably a little bit of a tumultuous uh, conversation here when you were going into arbitration and trying to talk him down to a shockingly no, uh, low number at $2.4 million. So Samsonov's probably not feeling too great about that situation. He's probably not feeling like he's a long-term fit with the Leafs. But that's because the Leafs are also in a situation where they've got someone like Joseph Wool. Now, I'm not going to pretend that Joseph Wool is the next big thing in the NHL and that he's a sure thing starter. But what he showed last year, especially when it came to his starts, when it came in his relief, and when it came in even his start in the postseason, he sh showed me at least that he's... He's ready. He, he belongs. And if he can maintain that throughout this entire season, if Joseph Wool can come in and all of his starts this season as the Toronto Maple Leafs backup are equally as good as his performance from last year, I would feel comfortable in two years time making Joseph Wool the starting goaltender. Now, there's still a lot of ambiguity there. Uh, he's had some injury history in the past. Last year was his first real stint in the NHL. You know, what can he provide from a long-term perspective? I mean, we had this situation when it came to someone like Garrett Sparks, who we thought was a sure thing, going to be a starter in the NHL, kind of set ourselves around having uh, Garrett Sparks come in, uh, especially when we moved Curtis McElhaney out in favor of Garrett Sparks, which I do think was the right move at the time, and I stand by that, even though hindsight shows that Sparks was not ready for the NHL, ultimately never ended up being ready for the NHL, and Leafs kind of got screwed in their asset management there, again, from a hindsight perspective. And I don't want that happening again this time, but if the Leafs can best prepare themselves to have Joseph Wall set up to be the starter in the future, I think that's the right move. So Ilya Samsonov at one year gives us a starting goaltender for one more year. It gives Joseph Wool the opportunity to be a backup. It gives us a really strong tandem. I would say one of the better tandems we have in a number of years here and allows Joseph Wool to develop just a little bit more and prove himself. And if he can do it, I think two years time, you're set to have Joseph Wool as your starting goaltender. Let Samsonov walk. I love Samsonov. I love his personality. I think he's a great goaltender. I think he's going to have a terrific NHL career. But given the Leafs situation and who they've got in their pipeline, it's not just Joseph Wolf. They've got a few other studs uh, in their prospect pool as well for the goaltending position. So 
I think it's just best that we keep as flexible as we can be. Not to mention the fact that in one year time, that's when Matthew's contract, whenever it's signed, will kick in. Same thing with William Lelander if we end up re-signing them both. So to have as much flexibility, as much money coming off the books in a year's time as possible, it sets the lease up for success. It allows them to either, you know, overpay to keep those guys. I hope that's not the case, but if you absolutely need to keep them, it allows you to do that. It allows you to pivot if you want to, you know, if you lose one of Matthews or Nylander and all of a sudden you're also negotiating with Tavares and Marner, it allows you to pivot, allows you to have a lot of flexibility for whatever you decide to do in the future. So one year, at the end of the day, I think it works out well for the Toronto Maple Leafs and I think it's a good number. And last thing that we've been hearing about, we've been hearing about it, you know, all season about Eric Carlson potentially coming to the Toronto Maple Leafs. What would that look like? And just a few days ago, Eric Carlson did confirm that he's A, requested a trade out of San Jose and is working with the team on it. But B, he's been speaking to a number of teams, I think only four. And yes, the Toronto Maple Leafs are on that list. So what do I think about the prospect of getting Eric Carlson? Absolutely not. Do not want it. And I know I'm probably in the minority here. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to come at it from the perspective of, I just don't think it could work, but I would love to have it happen. Honestly, even if you can make it work, I'm not really interested. And here's the reason being. Um, I don't want to discredit Eric Carlson because Eric Carlson, only a few years ago, was regarded as not only the best defenseman in the league, but one of the best players in the world. And we're talking at a time where Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin were in their prime. There was conversation that Eric Carlson was more impactful and a better player and more of an MVP to his team than the likes of Sidney Crosby or Alex Ovechkin or any of the other superstars that were in the league. And yes, he's coming off of a Norris Trophy, over 100 points. That's absolutely unheard of. If you were to look at what Eric Carlson can provide for your team, it's a, a unicorn. Only he and a handful of other guys. Off the top of my head, I think Kale McCarr is the only guy that comes even close to what Eric Carlson can provide. As far as providing offense from the defensive side, he is a unicorn. He is the best at what he does. 100%. But I have way too many concerns and I think there's way too much risk that it just completely outweighs the benefits of having Eric Carlson on your team. I mean, up until last season, where again, he had an explosive outburst of over 100 points, a resurgence in his career, it was fantastic to see, and I do like the guy. I want him to continue having those kinds of seasons. But two years ago, three years ago, Eric Carlson was regarded as having one of the worst, if not the worst contract in the entire NHL. Because this guy's getting paid, what is it, $11.5 million a year? He's a guy that has injury issues. Not just injury issues, but surgeries that can impact his long-term ability to play hockey. The report is when he had his ankle broken, he pretty much had half of his ankle removed and it impacted his ability to move on the ice, his skating ability, which is one of his biggest assets. And yes, last year, the guy proved he still got it. I understand that. He showed that even with the injury history and even with the bad contract and all the naysayers and the bad performances just a few years ago, he proved that he can bounce back. But what's more likely to be the long-term future here? Is it more likely that we get five of the next six years of Eric Carlson putting up 100 points? And I, I understand he did it on San Jose too. So if he goes to a team like Pittsburgh, like Toronto, a team that's got high offense, he can do it again. I get that. And it's very impressive. But I think it's more likely that over the next, I don't even know how long he has on his contract. Let's say it's five years, six years, something like that. I think it's more likely that over half of those years, you've got Eric Carlson being a bad contract on your team than being a steal. And that's what you want, especially with the Leafs situation. You can't have bad contracts on your team. You cannot afford that. You can't have average contracts on your team if they're at that number. I know we're talking about salary retention, but San Jose already said they're not retaining 50%. So you're paying seven or $8 million for Eric Carlson at a time where the cap is going up. I understand that. It will get better year over year as the cap continues to increase. But when you're paying $8 million for a guy that, let's say he regresses to a 60 point defenseman, that's a great defenseman to have on your team. Is it worth the $8 million investment when you've got the players like Matthews, like Marner, like Tavares, like Nylander? And I get that opens a whole nother can of worms, a whole nother conversation where we talk about us prioritizing the cap and trying to figure that out. But signs indicate that they're trying to bring the big four back. 
And I do believe that John Tavares, after his next contract, will take a hometown discount to stay in Toronto. And that maybe opens up the space to make something like this possible. But again, I think it's far more likely that Eric Carlson's coming up seasons, going into his mid thirties, he's not a young guy anymore. He's in the back end of, of his career. You're talking about another five years. What is he now, 31? We're talking, bringing him to 35, 36 years old, where you're paying him, you know, seven or $8 million. And he's likely going to decline year over year. I think in the short term, if you were to add Eric Carlson to my team, I'm ecstatic. I think it's fantastic. I think I'm buying his jersey. I think I'm gonna love watching that guy play. And I think he's gonna put up a ton of points. But that's in the short term. And it's important to think about the long-term future of this team. It's important to think that, hey, if shit hits the fan next year, if the Leafs don't make the playoffs or lose in the first round again, and they've got the flexibility of contracts coming off the book, and there's the possibility they pivot and want to retool, you do not want the likes of Eric Carlson on your team at that time. It just, I think there's far too much risk in it. I, I actually do really understand it from the perspective of like the Pittsburgh Penguins, where they're not, you know, in a position where they want to maintain assets in their rebuild. They're all or nothing. They're going to ride these guys, Crosby, Malkin, and Latang. They're going to ride those guys until they all retire, and then they're going to have to restart from scratch. So with Eric Carlson as part of that group, it gives them another chance at a Stanley Cup. It gives them, in the short-term window, the best opportunity to succeed without giving a shit about the long-term window. But as a Leafs fan, I do care. I care about where this team's going to be in three, four, five years. And I don't want to be in a position where we've got another contract on the Bucks that just makes no sense on an older guy that continues to decline, that's taking up cap space. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And again, I know that I'm in the minority here. People would love to have him. But I think we actually got a discount Eric Carlson on the team already in John Klingberg. Uh, it's a far-fetched comparison, but as far as what they can bring to the table, John Klingberg, a very offensive, gifted defenseman, not to the extent of Eric Carlson. He's not about to put up 100 points. If he does, I will eat my words and I will celebrate like crazy, but he's not about to put up 100 points. Again, Eric Carlson is an anomaly. He's, he's the best at what he provides. But when you're looking at where the team stands, the contract situation, what kind of investment you're looking to give. Giving John Klingberg $4 million for only one year is very, very low risk and gives your team a little bit, even an ounce of what Eric Carlson can bring. And that's exactly what you need him for. And that's all you need to do. And then again, you've got flexibility for the long term. So that's where I stand on that. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments down below. So there it is, quick video. Uh, not a whole lot to talk about right now. I wish there was more conversation. Uh, obviously, we're still waiting to hear about Matthews and Nylander. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. As soon as it does, I will hop on and talk. And I've been hearing a lot of conversation already about are the Leafs better or worse than they were last year? And I've got some strong opinions on that. So stay tuned for another video coming out soon and I will see you in the next one.